Right. So the main character is saying it. She already said here that the narrator is also saying it. Um, so we could, so let's replace with the short story states and let's replace that with either the main character or the narrator or the narrating character, right? Um, so what would you prefer? Somebody tell me. Yes, um, I'm asking what we're going to replace this with. Are we going to replace it with the narrator or the narrating character or the main character? What are we going to say? Okay. Okay, so we've replaced it, but then we need to say something other than states because this isn't really a statement, right? What is he really doing here? No, he's not quoting anybody. Quoting is if, as if he was going to say something that Martin Luther King said or something like that. Um, he's not quoting anybody. Explains, okay. I like that. He explains... Um, we could also say he describes how, right, then the men began to push us, right? So there are other things, but we've really got to ask ourselves what the narrator's doing. Is he explaining? Is he describing? Um, and we've got to get in touch with those, okay? Um, we've, got it, we've got another one here where it says the story presents... Um, and again, this would work great in like a research essay for 101 where you're making an argument. Um, absolutely. But here we have to really look at this and understand it. It says, I spoke automatically and with such fervor that I did not realize that the men were still talking and laughing until my dry mouth filling up with blood from the cut almost strangled me. All right. So once again, this is the narrator. So we'll say... <clears throat> the narrator, and now we've got to think about, we could just do what he says, but let's think about something a little bit more um, interesting than says. Um, is he arguing it? Is he admitting it reluctantly? Is he um, realizing it for the first time? Like, what is... What's his emotion there? And let's see if we can like get a little bit of his emotion into that quote integration phrase. What's his emotion here? What's happening in his mind? Right. So is this a realization or is this um, and it, like him admitting something he's ashamed of? What is this statement? OK. You could say he realizes you could say the narrator admits you could say the narrator um, <clears throat> You know, there, there's, we want to try to use these, and, and y'all have to know if I'm picking on stuff like this, you're doing a good job writing, <laughs> because, because I get to pick on, like, style stuff, right? That's pretty good news um, when I get to pick on style stuff, um, but I want you to think about these as somewhere where you get to put some personality in. And you, these are actually, let's not underestimate how much analysis is in these little quote integration phrases, how much awareness of the text gets communicated in these, um, how much understanding of the material gets communicated in these. Um, 
and how much personality gets communicated in these. Um, these are not little throwaway things. They might be in a research essay where all you've got to do is the article says, comma, quote, right? But these in, a, in, a, in, an, in an essay about research, these quote integration phrases are really essential to getting your reader to buy the fact that you're making this argument. They're, they're really actually important to the structure of the argument. So I don't want them to be little throwaway lines. Right. Um, I really like um, the analysis that follows these, so I'm not going to pick on those at all. Um, but I think um, a lot of us are just doing the narrator says, the narrator argues, and I or the narrator tells us. And I think we could boost those a little across the board and have some really stunning results. Look how nicely developed this paragraph is, though. Isn't that good? I think we want to aim for that. Um, and I like, I want to work on this as well because I love this impulse. Somebody read that to me, what's highlighted. I love it. I love that impulse to say this proves my thesis because I'm going to show you one thing okay these passages show how black people get unfairly treated no matter how hard they work or listen to the rules right no, the, the only thing I did in there was take out the proves my thesis. Because you know what your reader remembers? They remember your thesis, right? <laughs> your reader remembers your thesis. Um, but look how wonderfully this student has reminded us of the thesis and has taken, and this is something that was missing from a lot of paragraphs. I took a paragraph here that struggled with one thing, but did some other things really, really well. Um, this shows something that a lot of students were forgetting to do in their close readings, which was connect the close reading to what they're trying to prove, right? Um, and make sure that they make that connection at the end of a close reading paragraph and say, this proves my thesis because, right? And they did it in a, in a the language is a little bit formulaic, um, but they had it. Hallelujah, they had it. Um, and that's what revising is all about, is taking what you have and then, you know, polishing it up a little bit to sound uh, fancy um, or even sound more confident, right? Um, and I love um, him getting humiliated shows the respect Shows the, uh, now I would check this, I, you don't need the by, you can say him getting humiliated shows the lack of respect that white people have for black people. <coughs> um, <clears throat> and then that, but I really love how they are taking that time to connect their close reading back up to the thesis. Um, so there are some real high points here. But really, we're going to work on um, his not feeling ashamed. All right, so there's this is mostly editing and mostly for style that I'm working on here. But the two big points I wanted to make were working on those introductory phrases um, and making sure that you take the time and have the patience. Um, to connect it back to your thesis at the end of each close reading paragraph. Does that make sense? Okay, uh, I'm going to stop the share for a second and ask if there are questions about that. All right. Um, if there are not questions about that, I'm going to put you into, yes.
Someone started talking but is now muted. I can't hear you. D'Angelo, are you trying to talk? Because I can't hear you very well. D'Angelo, I'm going to suggest that you um, chat. Do you want to use the chat? Okay, I think he's going to try logging in again. All right. Um, <clears throat> are there questions about that? All right. I'm going to have you go into breakout groups. So when we're talking about the biography paragraph, we're really trying to establish the author's motivation for writing this kind of story or having this kind of main idea, right? You've established a thesis, and your thesis is really arguing what the main idea of the piece is. This piece is about this, right? Um, and so you're trying to establish in that biography paragraph why that would be something this author would have as a main idea. So in that way, it does support your thesis. You're saying, look, um, why is Ellison interested in writing about African-Americans and their voice? He's an African-American man. He has, he's been living in a racist society. It's not like by the time Ellison came along, all of our racist issues were solved, right? He's, he's struggling in a, in a civil rights era, like, you know, pre-civil rights era um, community. He's trying to be a voice um, for his people. Um, he's meeting with criticism as a voice of his people. Um, He's written a whole book um, called Invisible Man, y'all. And if that's not about being seen and heard, I don't know what is, right? So in this biography paragraph, you're talking about, you're trying to establish why the, you're trying to establish that, yes, this is what this, this story is about, in part because this is one of the interests of the author. Gilman is interested in teaching us that the rest cure didn't work. You'll know that if you choose the article, Why I Wrote the Yellow Wallpaper, <laughs> for one of your literary criticism pieces. Because why did she write the yellow wallpaper? Which is all of y'all's thesis, because I made sure it was your thesis, right? So, yes. So her biography here, we're choosing those details that she's from the Enlightenment age, um, the, I'm sorry, the Gilded Age, that she's um, suffered postpartum depression, that she was prescribed the rest cure, um, that it didn't go well, that she rebelled against it and spent a lot of her writing career after this trying to discredit the man who came up with the idea of the rest cure, right? So if your biography information isn't telling you that, keep looking. <laughs> um, but the sources do, they tell you that, right? Your biography sources tell you that. Um, with Amy Tan, your biography sources tell you that she is the, the child of, of Chinese immigrants. Um, and that this uh, novel is an autobiographical fiction, right, about what that's like to have that generational divide. Um, so, yeah, let's look at, let's look at the sample here together. Um, let me get that in front of you. It's going to take me one second to get it in front of you with the screen share, but we can do that in a heartbeat. All right, it should be sharing my screen. I am going to get to our sample and <clears throat> that's in our weekly assignments. I'm trying to think where the
sample student essay is? It was week six. I gave it to you right at the beginning, didn't I? Okay. Um, thank you. And this is the part where we're going to talk about not making it harder than it is. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, All right, so let's get to it here in the sample student essay. Let's look at their topic sentence because this is the attitude we want you to have. I'm gonna make it bigger so you can see it a little more easily. All right, um, let's just talk about the spirit of this. This student, and one of the reasons I chose this student's essay as a sample essay is that he was not an English major. Um, and sometimes he was a little formulaic, he was a little bit blunt, um, but he did really well because he understood what the concepts, right? And so sometimes the concepts, he might his writing might not be really polished, um, but what he had was like how everything relates. He really had the concepts of, of understanding what we were up to here. So, he just very simply, again, not a lit major here, um, not a writing major, um, just is like, okay, she told me to say how the biography connects. And so he wrote, the life of Ralph Ellison, the life Ralph Ellison lived shows why he would write about race issues and African American voices being heard. Yeah. And that's the spirit of it. The life shows why he would be trying to prove this. Right. Um, his, his the, the things that I'm pulling from his biography support the fact that I think this is about voices being heard. And that's all it has to be. Right. Um, the life he lived makes my thesis make sense. It supports it. Um, and so let's see, it says contemporary authors online published a biography about Ralph Ellison. Nice, simple short introductory sentence. The biography tells about Ralph Ellison's life and his works. The article states, um, and then he tells us about growing up in Oklahoma, a frontier state that had no tradition of slavery and where the relationship between races were more fluid and thus more, hum I think, humane than in the old slave states. Ralph Ellison became conscious of his obligation to explore the full range of American Negro humanity and to affirm those qualities which are of value beyond any question of segregation, economics, or previous condition of servitude. All right. Um, so now it looks as though he's quoting Ellison's own words here, and it would have been a little awesome if he had told us this. Um, but <laughs> remember when you're doing your source introduction, if you have a quote inside another quote that you take a sentence to tell us who's talking. Um, the article, so he might have summarized the beginning. Uh, the article states, tells us that he grew up in Oklahoma, which was a frontier state. Um, and then, Ella, and then um, the article quotes Ellison himself saying that he became conscious of his obligation and then quote the Ellison, right? Um, so slow that down a little bit is some advice there. Um, Ellison felt that because where he grew up was more hum humane, that he should explore and show people that African Americans and other races were equal. Throughout Ellison's life, he wrote many works addressing race relations. The article asserts this sense of obligation articulated in his 1964 collection of critical and biographical essays Shadow and act. Now he cut the meaning off there, so this isn't probably the best example. Um, that the person just could have said the article asserts that he felt a quote sense of obligation, um, and that you can observe that in his works from these um, from this book Shadow and Act, which should be italicized here. Um, so it said, and then underlining here, Shadow and Act is in his only piece, P-I-E-C-E, -E, of work discussing race. He also discusses it in Invisible Man, Juneteenth, and some other works. Um, 
Through his biography of the whole word, we can see Ellison's desire to be a voice for the American people. Even better if you say just like his main character in Battle Royale, right? Finish up that connection. Now, again, this isn't perfect, but he has the concept. And he did it well enough that I chose it to be a sample essay, right? Um, so when you're looking at this, he's the, the key points here are the life he lived shows why he would write about race issues, right? Um, and then Ellison feeling like um, he wants to be a voice for his people, right? And then connecting it to that, um, connecting it to that uh, story that we read. Does that make sense? Okay, so. Yes. Yes, exactly. Why would she pick that? I mean, you're looking for those biographical details that tell you why she would why she would write about what she wrote about. If you're talking about Gilman, you're using this paragraph to establish that she suffered postpartum depression. She was prescribed the rest cure. It didn't go well and she didn't like it. Right. I mean, and if you do, you know, a couple of quotes just supporting that, that's your paragraph right there. Don't make it harder than it needs to be. Right. <laughs> um, we like to overthink sometimes, um, but that's OK. Um, it's it's probably not a crisis. Um, now, uh, these aren't due till the end of the week. So if you really didn't like yours and you feel like it kind of missed the point, um, that's OK. But the idea is that you're trying to establish that the author would have said, yes, this is this is the thesis. This is the main idea of what I was writing. This is what I was trying to communicate because there are details in their life that do explain why they're writing what they're writing. Um, and the point of having this paragraph about the, about the author and their biography is to just kind of get in the, the student reader's head that nothing comes from nothing. Stories are coming out of the author's experiences and interests, and they're grounded in the author's history and the history of the characters, and they're grounded in the cultural context of the author and their characters, right? Um, and that we, when we analyze a piece of literature, we're looking at, we're trying to understand all of that. We're trying to understand, now we can't always know the author's motivations down to the T, unless they're still alive and we can ask them. Um, but we can make a connection between the author's experiences and interests and what they write. And it's a really valuable connection to make. And that's what we're trying to get at in this paragraph. Does that make sense? Okay. Are there other issues that we need to talk about with the biography, the cultural context, or the historical context. <laughs> no, just just pick the details that prove what you're trying to prove. Just you're you're basically saying it my thesis makes sense because I know about the author and I know this is where they were coming from. Okay? Um so when you write longer pieces of literary analysis like you're doing now, one of the things that you have to spend considerable time doing is establishing that you know about the author. 
right? We're only doing a paragraph to establish that we know about the author, but it's always with the mind of, I know the author well enough that I can make arguments about their work. Um, imagine if we misunderstood Alice Walker as um, a white lady. That would change the dynamic of this story tremendously. It would change our dislike of D tremendously. It would make it aggressive toward D, right? Where it's not at all, right? Um, it would be like, oh, who's this lady changing her name? Who does she think she is? It would be a really weird and unhappy switch, right? If the author were different than she is and had different motivations than she does. Imagine Gilman's piece written by a man. Ew, ick, problematic, to the max. All of a sudden, we really don't like it because it's just one more iteration of a man explaining how crazy women are and can't handle things and get hysterical, right? Not good, right? The, the author's position changes things, right? Um, if a white man were writing about how black men were invisible, all of a sudden we have a really racist text on our hands instead of a text that's trying to expose the problem of racism. Does that make sense? So establishing the author's point of view, their place, the place from which they're writing becomes essential, right? It's putting it in, a, in its own context of saying, I mean, think about um, somebody who's writing about Chinese immigrants who, again, is a white person from the dominant culture, and they're not going to write about it the same way. They're going to be stereotyping, and all of a sudden, this whole tiger mom stereotype that we've got going on here is really problematic because it's not written from the inside that culture with any understanding or nuance or anything. It's just, I've heard this about Chinese immigrants, and I'm going to write about it, and it would be a mess, right? It would be offensive. Um, so understanding your author and how they relate their experiences to their literature that they're producing is really important. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, other questions about the art about the pieces that you're using this week? Um, yeah, I think in particular, the, the most successful piece that people f um, located for the cultural context was that Ferris University piece on the actual battle royales of 1917, um, because Ellison was definitely thinking about that phenomenon in particular, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, and that, that don't overwork that paragraph. Ellison is talking about a real cultural phenomenon that used to exist, and here's what it used to look like, and here were, um, here was why it was problematic culturally, um, and why he's trying to expose it, right? Um, yeah. Okay. Other questions about these paragraphs? <laughs> All right, so I think when we're talking about the history of the text, we're trying to show um, what part of, um, in some ways, this is, it's, it's a background paragraph and a paragraph establishing that um, the thesis makes sense for the history it was focusing on. Um, so you're not going to say that black men are struggling to find a voice if you're talking about enslaved people who really had no chance of it. It would be a very different conversation, right? Um, then we'd be talking about Negro spirituals um, and coded language um, and um, all sorts of different things. So you're trying to establish that here's a time when, when um, black men were supposedly free to speak their minds legally and yet were um, terrorized 
and persecuted to a point where they couldn't have that voice that they were legally due, right? Um, which is different than when they were not considered to have any legal standing as their own human being. They were property, which is hard to grapple with, but it would change that conversation, right? It would change the conversation now, like black men's voices, the conversation about black men's voices and the ability to speak for themselves is different now than it was when Ellison was writing about it. Um, it's, it's different. It's not necessarily all the way better, but it's different. Now we get talking about issues of um, whether black men are allowed to sound angry um, when, <laughs> or fed up, right? But that's not what Ellison's talking about. He's trying to like, can we speak at all? Um, which is different than are we always perceived as aggressive or um, frightening when we express frustration, which is more today's conversation about voice, right? Um, if you present a defense um, against racism now, you might be pegged as an angry black person, but then you were literally in danger for your life. It's a different conversation because it's a different history, right? Um, if you're talking about Alice Walker's character D and you don't understand anything about the Pan-African movement going on at the time, it's really weird that she changed her name to Wanjero, right? <laughs> it's weird. But if you understand the Pan-African movement that was going on and the enlightenment she must have felt and this awakening she was experiencing about her history and her culture that had been robbed from her family, et cetera, et cetera, you, she's a whole different character, right? If you understand the history. With Gilman, if you don't go into it understanding anything about the Gilded Age and how women were treated in the Gilded Age, you're not understanding this at all, right? We need to make sure we understand women's very limited control over their own person and own body at the time, or this doesn't make sense. Right now, if I needed psychiatric treatment, it would be largely up to me to say what I needed. I would choose my practitioner myself. My husband wouldn't choose it for me. I would have to seek the help. I would be in a position to tell them whether I wanted medication or not. I would be able to um, talk to them about whether I wanted inpatient treatment or not. Um, there's a whole culture now about having a patient participate in their own care. This is not what's happening with psychiatry in the Gilded Age and certainly not treating women's physical or mental health in the Gilded Age, right? Women didn't get to choose their own doctors. It was a family doctor. He treated you. You had to do what he said. Your husband could have you committed to an asylum without your consent, y'all. And so there's some history there about women's rights and what women's rights there were and were not, right? Um, with the Amy Tan, it's important to understand the difference in Chinese immigration from the 1800s to the 1940s. They were immigrating for different reasons. They were immigrating into a different atmosphere um, with different attitudes towards Chinese immigrants when they got here. So it's very different, right? And the relationship of the characters to each other is different because of the attitudes toward Chinese people from the people around them, right? The mom's not trying to get the daughter to be a super success just for no reason. She's trying to make sure her daughter can survive in a culture that's different from the one she herself grew up in, right? So you've got to make sure you understand that history. Does that make sense? Okay, um, so all of them are trying to prove that your thesis is not always like prove your thesis, but prove that your thesis is valid, that it comes from a place of fully understanding the author, the text, the culture, the history, right? Um, so not everything is like, see, I told you the rest cure was a bad idea. Some of the paragraphs are, see, I know what I'm talking about because I know about the history the characters were in. I know about the culture the characters were in. I know about the author. Therefore, what I say about the story has merit, 
because I'm smart and I did my research. Does that make sense? Yay. Okay. Other questions about these? All right. We are entering our last 15 minutes, so I am going to stop the recording and start taking questions or um, just workshopping with students who need some additional help. So if you got in your feedback that I needed you to stay on for a moment, definitely stay on. If you didn't do last week's assignment, definitely stay on. Um, or if you have just general questions uh, that you need me to go over individually with you, stay on. If you're feeling equipped and empowered to do this week's work, you can go get started on it. 